for yeah. the live stream. Okay. Yeah, I would say we're probably gonna start about five minutes. start at 6.05. We're on. Okay. Hi, everybody. I want to welcome you to our second research week event, um, a conversation about uh, approaches and communication of uh, strategies related to climate change. Um, and I'm so excited that we're able to bring together an interdisciplinary panel of faculty and graduate students. It's really exciting for me. I'm so excited for this conversation. Um, Research Week is an opportunity for us to showcase our students, um, both graduate and undergraduate um, students, and also approaches to research. So I think that this panel kind of does it all. Um, quick thank yous to the Dean's Office, the School of Arts and Sciences, the Graduate School, the Vice Chancellor for Research and Collaboration, um, and all the home departments of our faculty and graduate students. Um, and an extra special thank you to Neil Marr, our colleague across the street um, at NJIT, who is a history professor in our federated department. Um, he has graciously agreed to do this. He is fabulous. Um, he would be on this panel in his own right. Um, his work, uh, you know, on environmental history and conservation and space. I mean, he does it all. Um, so he's going to be excellent today. Um, so just one quick reminder, Research Week does not end today. Um, there is a student presentation for their posters that's taking place tomorrow at 2.30 um, on AirMeet. And on Thursday at 4 o'clock, the labs on our campus are going to present some of their research. So we hope to see you at all the events. But thank you so much for coming to this event. And I will turn it over to Neil. Thank you so much, Laura. I really appreciate the introduction and I appreciate uh, you inviting me to be moderator of what I know is going to be a really interesting and exciting conversation. <clears throat> I also want to thank all of you for tuning in during what I know is an extremely busy time, you know, made even busier due to the pandemic. So we really appreciate you tuning in. Um, I want to thank the panelists as well for taking time out of their busy schedule and, and you know, conversing with us also. 
Um, what I want to do tonight is we want to have a, a conversation. So this is not going to be presentations by um, these panelists, but rather a, a real dialogue on climate change um, and their work on climate change, um, their research, their teaching, um, and also their public um, outreach on that topic as well, because all three of those are really related and all inform one another. And that's part of this, this, this conversation as well. Um, the conversation will initially include uh, six academics, all from our Rutgers Newark community. They're from a wide variety of fields. We have uh, scientists, literary theorists, historians, and even business scholars. And then also from a variety of, of stages in their career. And both of those sort of characteristics were very conscious um, in, in putting the panel together. We wanted the audience to understand that, that climate change research can be done um, from a wide variety of fields and even uh, interdisciplinarily. Um, and also that climate change research does shift as one's career changes and different um, emphases uh, take precedent at certain times. So we wanna have that, that conversation as well. But the conversation is also going to include all of you out there. Um, I want that to be a dialogue more than just us talking. Um, so I wanna begin that conversation right now by having everyone open up their chat, if they could, and just let us know where you're viewing from, just so we can get a sense of, of where you are and also so we can initiate that, that dialogue and that conversation right now. So the format tonight, let's, let's see some chats coming in if we could. Um, the format tonight will begin with very brief introductions. I'm gonna keep them extremely brief because I want the panelists to really talk about their own research. Then we'll spend about 45 minutes um, in conversation uh, with questions that I'll, I'll pose. Um, and we'll have some good back and forth on that front. And then we'll spend the remaining time um, expanding the conversation to you all in a Q&A. And here we have Bloomfield, New Jersey, Verona, Englewood, Hackettstown, Lynnhurst, Elizabeth, fantastic, Houston, Texas, someone's in from Houston, Texas, Bristol, Maine, fantastic. Um, just a note about the Q&A. Um, I think it's really more productive if I can try to integrate some of the questions into the panelists' conversation. So please post the questions as we're talking. And that way, what I'll do is I will sort of grab onto some of those questions, perhaps as, as follow-ups to keep that conversation going. And then what we're going to do is we're going to um, collect all the questions as they come in. And then during the Q&A, we're going to repost them so we'll have them all and then we can move through um, those questions during the q a as well um, so hopefully through all that technological strategy we can keep this conversation going okay so now i'm going to begin with our extremely short intros and i'm going to begin with our graduate students okay uh, tuba alton is a third year phd student in the global urban studies program where her research focuses on climate migration and the built environment of cities. Hannah Jocelyn is a doctoral student in our American Studies program, where she researches the uh, intersections of indigenous place knowledge, climate justice, and intersectional feminism. Uh, third up, Omanjana Gaswami is a PhD student in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences, uh, where she studies chemical contamination of urban drinking water and food supplies. Um, our faculty members include Professor Alec Gates, who is a distinguished service professor and chair of the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. Most recently, Professor Gates has focused his work on placing the causes and impacts of climate change into an Earth history context. Professor Kevin Lyons is an associate professor of professional practice in the Rutgers Business School where he serves as director of the business school's public-private community partnership. Professor Lyon's work focuses on integrating ethical and environmental criteria and data regarding global supply chains. Finally, we have Professor Jack Chen. Um, Jack, as I know he would like to be called, is the director of the Price Institute on Ethnicity, Culture, and the Modern Experience. He's an historian, curator, writer, and founder of the New York, Newark Public History Project, and has recently been appointed to the New York City Panel on Climate Change. So welcome panelists, and, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, I wanna begin with 
question, general questions about your own climate change work. So if you could just each give us a brief introduction, description um, regarding your current academic work, researching, teaching, and or promoting public awareness around uh, this extremely important issue. Um, anyone want to jump in first? Um, and we can just sort of move and, and hopefully riff off each other and, and keep it going. Who feels bold? I'll have to call on you if you don't volunteer. Alec, you want to? Sure. Uh, I'm always, I've always eager to open my mouth and say things, so I'm happy to go first. Uh, so um, I don't do so much straight up research on climate change anymore, but I've done a lot of work on uh, on informing the public through a bunch of institutions. I started the Highlands Environmental Research Institute uh, to help with uh, educate people on environmental issues, including climate change from the Highlands area of New Jersey. I've done lots of writing in books and in articles and in, uh, you know, and even written my own books with it as well. And also recently, and we're still working on this, is that I've worked uh, with uh, Dr. Lyons to start off with, but also Dr. Chen is in on it now, that we have proposed to start a uh, institute for coastal climate change in urban areas, which would include the whole uh, Newark area. So we've been doing a lot of work together on that most recently. Fantastic. Thank you, Alec. Thank you. Anyone else feel like segueing in? We don't have to go with the professors first. The graduate students can get in here anytime they want. Hannah. I'll chime in. I, it's not a good segue because I think our work is uh, very different avenues, but maybe that's great because it's interdisciplinary. Um, but like Neil said, I'm, I'm currently working on my dissertation and I'm teaching an environmental feminism class for undergraduates. Um, and my focus is on, for my dissertation, is on contemporary writing by border crossing women in North America and how their fiction might be a conduit to combating climate change. Um, and my research really takes these literary cultural artifacts as the entry point and picks up on um, Larry Buell's instructions for the future of environmental criticism to ask how we can define a distinctive model of literary inquiry that activates readers in the fight against climate disaster. So that's really my uh, focus right now. And um, I hope that it leads to something uh, that will be <laughs> helpful for other people to pick up on too. Great, thank you very much. I think it's a perfect segue from science to literature. Where are we gonna go next? Kevin, you want to jump in? I'll go ahead and jump in since uh, my meeting was imposed by Alec. Um, <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so my research, my entire portfolio of research for my entire career has been focused on this idea of, of business and its integration with climate change. Uh, specifically, my research is looking at the impact of, of consumerism and products themselves, the carbon footprint of each and every type of product that's produced and manufactured to me is, is outrageous. So a lot of my research grants have been with uh, the federal government, state governments, and policymakers about what can we do to um, connect consumption and consumerism to um, climate change, to make it more personal rather than it's some big thing that scientists have to take care of. What is it that individuals need to do um, to make the right choices and having the best information is one way that I'm approaching this. So eventually my research is going to involve uh, carbon labeling of products. So that's what I'm currently working on right now. Cool. That's great. Who would like to, Tuba, you seem like you're going for your <laughs> mouse to unmute yourself. <laughs> I think Omanda and I just unmuted herself. You can go first, Tuba. So uh, my research is about climate changes, intangible impacts on climate migrants, basically. So in terms of you know those intangible impacts, I mean um, like loss of culture, loss of traditions, PTSD associated with displacement, and also the grief associated with all of these relocations. 
So I realized that all of things are happening in places, in different places, and it influences uh, people's relationship with the uh, people's relationship with their place attachment. So uh, in this regard, I'm hoping to understand how these new built environments are actually influence and help uh, people to rene renegotiate with their place attachment. So pretty much. Great. I'll go next, yeah. So uh, my research is again focused on, um, you know, addressing the scientific um, aspect of pollutants in the urban environment, especially. And in my last few years, I've looked at uh, uh, pollutants in urban community farming soils, especially um, in Newark with, uh, and focused a lot on lead in drinking water as well as uh, urban farms of Newark. And along that journey, um, I took a brief stint um, to serve as a policy advisor um, uh, in the US uh, Congress for Congressman Tulsi Gabbard. And I worked on um, science-based conservation as well as management policies um, with a more deep focus on Hawaii issues because she was from Hawaii, nonetheless on, on a national scale and learned sort of, you know, how I can use my science to promote um, better policies, both at the national as well as at the local level and sort of tie science together with some of these tangible policies that need to be implemented right now to deal with the climate crisis. Fantastic. How long did you, did you do that for? A, a year? Or? Um, I did that for a year, and I'm still in touch with that community in one sense or the other. Um, so I keep track of whatever is happening, whatever law, bills are introduced. I have an extensive network of like friends and uh, peers who work in that space. So I still try to keep up with it in addition to doing my graduate work, which isn't easy. It's like two different worlds. But um, I think it's very necessary because sometimes as scientists, uh, doing policy work doesn't really come to us naturally. We we are more comfortable in the environment, you know, of the research lab. Um, and stepping out of that was like a big daunting move, especially for me. I've never really done anything in life that, that was not research. Uh, but using that research to sort of, you know, move the direction of policy was very humbling also at the same great, time. Great. And uh, Jack? Well, um, I want to be last because I'm really the imposter in this whole group. Uh, I don't have any uh, studied or research expertise. I've really come to this topic um, late in my um, research career uh, as I moved from NYU to Newark, which was just uh, three years ago. I, I realized this was an opportunity to really act on matters that I cared deeply about, but had not done anything about. And um, so for me, I guess I'm really thinking that my skills are to um, are, are really as a as a public scholar and a public historian, and that um, I'm also just trying to grapple with why is it that we can't deal with this question. You know, I mean, I'm I'm talking about myself, but also just as a society, but also even um, in a university such as ours, which is very progressive and really grounded in so many great values, it's really hard to get us all to be thinking about one of the greatest issues in our lifetimes that we're all facing. And if we look at the climate clock, it's, you know, um, six, six, uh, six years and um, uh, 300 and some days, I, I don't have the exact, maybe 200, 225 days, 226 days. And, um, you know, that's, and, and we know from, um, from, from all the different things that are going on uh, in terms of fires, um, greater, you know, hurricane, storm systems, that things are starting to accelerate. And it seems to be palpable in terms of people beginning to recognize with it. But so really my research question is really with my students is how can we actually create a space in the campus and in the, in the larger area to start actually grappling with these questions in a way in which we can start organizing together. So I really think of myself as, uh, as much of a, as an organizer, but also I have the privilege of learning from people uh, who are here, for example, who, um, who really have a lot more knowledge to offer. Thank you all. That's fantastic. And, you know, 
you can just see from those responses that everyone is coming to this from such you know diverse areas, such diverse fields. And it sort of segues into the next question about you know the nature of interdisciplinary research and um, you know uh, its benefits and also perhaps some of its its uh, you know challenges. So I'm wondering if if you know because each of you come at climate change from such different fields, but also you know from different practices, whether it's research or activism or policy or science. Um, do you undertake inter interdisciplinary research yourself? And if so, what do you feel are the, the benefits of doing that? And also, also discuss maybe what are some of the, the challenges or the potential problems of doing that sort of research, um, you know, within academia and also maybe within, you know, more popular culture. Um, so I can answer that because um, that's an easy one. That's what, that's what we call a layup. Um, interdisciplinary get harder, research. Kevin. They're going to get harder. <laughs> but don't get ready. This is this is I think, and this is just coming from my my research recently, uh, the last five years or so. This is almost like a requirement. You know, if you do not have an interdisciplinary approach to this particular challenge then you will be working for the next several decades trying to figure out what is your role. So every one of my projects and research grants involves all the, uh, the uh, disciplinaries as much as I can possibly find. Uh, so I'm in the business school, but you know, there's a lot to know about social justice, environmental justice. We have to deal with the humanities and culture you know, you can make a decision unilaterally saying that this is what I believe is the right choice based on my research, but you're going to trip up against everybody else's uh, research. And, and if it's not collaborative in nature, then it is really going to take you a while to get anything done. So, and I also think that even the, the NSFs and others are, are requiring that you have a, a multidisciplinary approach to your research grants. Um, or we're not even going to consider um, your application in some cases. So, you know, it's all about benefits um, that I can see. I can't really think of anything negative uh, off the top of mind. I really, I agree with Dr. Lyons completely. I think that all of this work is interdisciplinary um, and that it, it needs to be. And then if we think of this work as public humanities, which it also needs to be in order to make a difference outside of the academy, then the way to reach the most people is by taking an interdisciplinary or a multi-directional or, or collaborative approach. And, and I mean, for me personally, this means thinking about how literature can help us imagine what change might look like on the ground beyond logistics and beyond policy and how it can help us recruit more people to the cause. And I don't think you can do that without um, interdisciplinarity at all. So what do you say to people who would argue that, you know, you first need to sort of dig really deep in your field to really get at the, the real issues um, and then sort of doing that might make it difficult, for instance, for a scientist to really connect or communicate with a, um, a humanities scholar. I mean, that's the argument, right, against that sort of, you know, interdisciplinarity. And we're hearing much less of it, I agree, but there, there are still some voices out there who say that. What do we say to those people who wonder about that interdisciplinary, you know, sort of program. Is that for a question for no, me? No, for everybody. I'm just okay. if, you know, if, if, is this even on our radar or are we just so far beyond this that it's like, don't even worry about it, just move on? Well, I also think there's different ways of doing is for interdisciplinarity um, and doing interdisciplinary scholarship. Like it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to incorporate it into your scholarly right. practice. It can mean you can reach across to somebody right who's in another group and, and that's coalitional and collaborative in an interdisciplinary way. So I think that's how I might combat that criticism. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I would just say that um, the enormous um, problem and challenges that we're facing are way beyond the boundaries of the university and we can't be limited by them. Um, we need to use all the tools we can find and get. Um, and clearly um, I'm glad you know, Kevin mentioned social justice. I mean, social justice, we can, we can stay within the university and talk about social justice, but ultimately we have to expand the boundaries and social justice is so deeply intertwined with the kinds of 
difficulties we're having as a society to come together and to grapple with this. Uh, in many ways, I think the evidence of what's happened during the pandemic and what happens during disasters is that there's that initial moment of people thinking that they're coming together, but then the schisms that are deeply entrenched and have never been quite addressed begin to erupt and emerge and we're still uh, experiencing that. I mean, it's, it's almost like whiplash now from week to week about what's going on. And uh, without those deeper, uh, deeper, larger society, societal issues that we're addressing, um, you know, we can't just, we can't, I don't think we can retreat to the privileged positions within academia and just talk about specialization this and we won't work outside of that area. So this brings up another issue. So we have, you know, interdisciplinarity, but we also have sort of university community sort of crossing boundaries as well that's, that's, that Jack, you're saying is equally important. And I remember that Alec earlier mentioned you all worked together on a Highlands project. So maybe could you talk about both the interdisciplinary character of that program, but also how it goes beyond the university? Um, I, don't know if, I, don't, I think all three of you are involved in it. I don't know who wants to take the, the, the lead on this. Well, the Highlands project was, that was just that I did. This other one that we're proposing now is with all of us, this uh, IC3U. And, um, you know, I mean, the, the big thing with, um, I mean, we're, and we're, you know, that's what I always look for. So, I mean, I got together with Kevin to start this off and we said, you know, the reality is, is everybody's known about the climate change from the scientific end all the way back from the 50s, you know, when it was the industrial effect with, uh, with Hans Seuss and it didn't go anywhere. And so the reality is until we get everybody, you know, doing something about this, we're not going anywhere. And we're not even in the ballpark of really ad addressing climate change at this point, even though we've known about it for, for 50 years or even more, 60 or 70 years, we're not even in the ballpark of getting, of getting over it. So if you don't involve everybody at this point and to, uh, to be, you know, to get in on the game, we're not gonna. We're never gonna get through this. So. Majana, do you want to speak or say anything or tuba before we move on? Um, yeah, I think um, you know when you talk of interdisciplinarity, it it helps root our research in reality. And especially as a scientist, it's um, often very easy to sort of lose sight of that. Um, you know, when we address scientific questions and work towards you know experiments and results and research in the lab. Uh, sometimes we can be very far removed from the reality and climate change now. There's no time for that. So it's, I think, the need of the moment is to steer our attention, our focus, and our research towards addressing some of the bigger needs. And uh, community-focused research is actually a fantastic way to do that. Um, it's, a, it's a great, I did most of my research um, with the community. I work with community gardens in Newark and um, even though, um, you know, it's something that we, we don't anticipate doing as we go into a PhD program sometimes, at least I didn't, um, it offered me the great opportunity to learn how to communicate with people who uh, might not necessarily, you know, come from the same educational background um, as me, and it helped me learn make science more accessible, and I think that's a skill that we will absolutely need going forward when we, you know, think of how to tackle the climate crisis um, as, you know, different disciplines come together with social scientists, economists, and politicians on the same table. Um, it's very easy to sort of haze over the signs because it's, it can be so inaccessible sometimes. Um, and learning how to communicate is a big step of that. And community-focused research, I think, helps sort of transcend that barrier um, to a large extent. And the communities have local knowledge and there's indigenous mm -hmm. knowledge that's also very important for us to learn, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a, it goes both ways. Yeah, good. Tuba? Also add the fact that, you know, the past practices you know, told us that you know, you cannot separate or differentiate the subject into, you know, smaller subcategories and, you know, analyze and assess them and or take an action accordingly. You have to think you know, by integrating different approaches simultaneously so that, you know, you can work together, understand together and, you know, change the nature of this research. Otherwise, you know, you can give 
let's say I was an architect, I used to be an architect, and I always, you know, thought, thought that if I draw a beautiful skyscraper, I uh, by including all these, you know, ecological aspects, I will help to, you know, build a climate resilience. But then I realized, you know, if I will keep ignoring the community, I cannot, you know, be a part of this change or I cannot help building a climate resilience because I will always miss the local knowledge. So I think we cannot differentiate or like, you know, make small pieces out of this huge process. Right, great. Thank you so much. Before we move on, um, Jack, I know you've been very involved with um, some of the indigenous communities in northern New Jersey. Do you want to discuss how that experience has informed your, you know, moving beyond the university sort of idea? Uh, yeah, um, many people in New Jersey may not know that one of the worst Superfund sites in, in the country is really just in northern New Jersey. And our impression of northern New Jersey is that of course it's beautiful lakes, beautiful land, beautiful mountains, you know, places that people go for summer camp. But in, uh, in Ringwood, uh, where the Rampo uh, Lenape folks live, especially the Turtle Clan folks, it's also the site of a disastrous 50-year uh, fight uh, where the Ford Motor Assembly Plant had, when they closed down, uh, contracted the, the, the town of Ringwood and massive tonnage of uh, paint sludge uh, full of toxin, carcinogenic car uh, toxins were dumped into some of the um, Hewitt landmines uh, that were you know, deep tunnels um, adjacent uh, to the watershed areas. Uh, but also on land, you know, kind of midnight runs, people dumped it in, in where people live. And it's just been a heartbreaking um, series of uh, community folks in the Rampo community who have just been dying, young people, old people, from all sorts of um, uh, diseases and uh, afflictions. Um, so it's, you know, it's been shocking to me. Um, and as I've gotten to know, I've been working with um, Chief Vincent Mann of the Turtle Clan and also Clan Mother Michaeline Picarlman, and I've just been learning so much about their ongoing intimacies with the land, but also the, the fight, the necessary fight that they're engaged in, in, in trying to get some kind of justice and trying to really protect their peoples. So um, for me, and certainly for the students who have been taking these classes, it's been an eye opener, you know. Uh, we first of all, most people don't think that. Oh no, there are no Indians, you know, in New Jersey. They're all gone, you know. Um, well, first of all, they're here. They've been here for hundreds of years, and um, and part of the um, the this is where the kind of reckoning with a deep history that's never been quite uh, acknowledged or resolved. Um, the dispossession of Native uh, Lenape peoples from the region and their deep knowledge of the region and their deep connections with, um, with cultivating the lands. Um, all that in some ways needs to be reckoned with, I think for us to be able to actually appreciate um, the scope of how we have to grapple with the region as a whole and, and grapple with climate change and, and to take all these things into account. Thank you. Um, so another of the goals of the, the session was to sort of highlight academic careers. This is for a lot of our students who are tuning in, thinking about an academic career and trying to navigate that, that, that journey, which is often difficult, but you know, hopefully rewarding. Um, so my question, next question is really about your own academic careers. And I'm wondering how your own approach to, to climate change work has perhaps changed over time during your career. What has become more important as a scholar, teacher, and public advocate, and perhaps what has become less so. And I know we have two sort of different stages of careers here, so we're going to get probably quite different types of answers. And I would encourage, you know, maybe some conversation between you all, you know, maybe um, to, to spark this more than just, just responding, but so someone can go for it or ask another panelist a question or or along the scene. 
Well, I mean, so I could I can ask Omanjana a question if that's all right. So Omanjana, right. I mean, right. you were I mean, you kind of alluded to it already. You've been so immersed in the sciences and the specialization and pursuing the PhD and the dissertation writing, and but then your experience in working in the Senate. Uh, really seem to have dramatically impacted you. Um, could you talk a little bit about that and then what you take out of that experience? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, getting into the PhD program, um, I kind of came with the idea that um, I want to be an academic. I want to stay in the academy and pursue research. And um, I didn't really think of the world beyond that. I, I didn't know of it. I was ignorant. And when I sort of stepped outside of the boundaries, of you know the traditional discipline and experience, how I can use the science. I mean, I'm not foregoing you know my my research knowledge or even the skills that I've gained, you know, as a part of the process, and sort of translate that into executable actions. Um, I think that has been very fundamental in sort of keeping me grounded and also made me realize that I there are options beyond. The, you know, the traditional academic disciplines um, to use our knowledge skills as scientists and to work in these policy roles. And sometimes these roles need not be like a full-time job. I'm actually at that point of, you know, looking for options outside um, of graduate school, because as I'm thinking of um, defending my thesis in the next few months, I'm also looking for career options. And it sort of helped me um, ground my search into what I think would be like a good career choice for me. And one of that is, um, you know, working in the discipline of um, climate change, sci the science of climate change and policies that can um, sort of direct the right movement. And there are tons of organizations who are doing fantastic grassroots level work. Uh, the national ones are of course the more popular ones, uh, many that have the headlines basically. But what I'm more interested in is sort of, you know, going down deep into the community, um, because like I said, once I started working on some of the policy stuff and saw it move through Congress, um, or sometimes even being taken up um, uh, by certain organizations, it's deeply gratifying uh, just to see being able to sort of, you know, steer that change. And uh, I feel that's important as scientists, you know, are... Um, our achievements are often uh, thought of as research grants and papers and uh, promotions. And I'm sure Dr. Gates uh, can attest to that because he has a long career in you know, the traditional academic discipline. But uh, I just feel that now at this point, it's, uh, we need to take the risk to take, you know, sort of tackle the challenge of, of the moment. And I'm, I'm kind of at that juncture where I'm gonna take that risk. I think that's great because I know in my own career, I was worried about that risk early on. Mm -hmm. And I think academ academia was maybe different way back then, but I think now it's much more acceptable. And um, I'm glad that, um, you know, people in your situation feel more mm -hmm. comfortable doing that, right? It's very different. Anyone else want to jump in on this? Uh, I, I guess I should, at least because I started my career in a probably everyone will shudder, but I worked for an oil company when I was in the beginning of my career. So I actually found the oil that got burned in cars and things. And, you know, it was, they paid well, and it was a lot of fun figuring out the, how the earth worked. I was always conservation minded. I didn't drive a big car or anything like that. But, you know, I kind of lasted for a few years and I really had a hard time, you know, justifying working for an oil company. So I got out of the oil business and went back to academia and started just regular work in academia. But then I started to, to engage the public. And so a lot of the projects I've done, you know, I've worked with museums and I now have a museum displays all over, you know, in several of the museums around here that impact, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And I also had pro programs specifically to get people, you know, the general public to understand, you know, environmental issues and maybe to then, you know, as I said, it's education that they can act on it. So my career has gone, you know, a 180 from, you know, contributing to the problem to trying to help it. I hope I've, uh, I hope I've uh, broken even by now. So. <laughs> if they're doing work like you're doing, um, they think of it, if anything, you know, sort of in the other way, 
as, as contributing maybe to some of the capital capitalism that's causing this problem. So I'm, I'm just personally interested in how you got to where you are. Yeah, actually, um, I was that person that everybody hated in the office, um, in the business, because from high school, literally from high school, I was involved with, you know, the environmental club and all the things that I was doing back then. And I graduated from high school so young that I couldn't go to college. I was not old enough. So if your parents signed the paperwork, which they did, you can go into the military. And from that point forward, the military for six years uh, was a battle because I was fighting. Um, I was responsible for the acquisition and procurement of everything, but I challenged every single thing that I had to purchase because it had an environmental impact to the point where I went from the most hated soldier in the, in the military to probably the most decorated, which is actually a good arc because I was able to figure out how they could be uh, environmentally responsible and still do the things that they had to do. Um, so that's how I began my career. And then I left the military and um, went through a, a series of, of positions where, again, my job, I, I thought, was to challenge everything. So I'll get hired because I have the credentials. But once I get in, then the terrorist is born. And so everyone, in a sense, came around eventually to my seeing the way that I saw things and saw that we could still have a profit and do business and still protect the environment. And that's been my sort of mantra uh, ever since. And that's what my, my scholarship is about as well. You know, we don't have to always think about the, the bottom line. There's more than what, you know, profit. And you can have in some cases a profit and still protect people and the, in the planet at the same time. Once you learn how to do that, then the, then the sky's the limit. So all my scholarship has been about that intersection. And it's, it's doable, and that's where I base my, my, my entire academic career on as well. So um, it really has been you know, a positive um, arc. There's, there's a follow-up question, Kevin, for you, if I could ask. Um, sure. um, one of the audience members is wondering what your research looks like on the ground or in the landfills. Yeah, so, so much says about my landfill. So I do archaeological digs and landfills, looking at the, uh, literally as an archaeologist would look at the culture about people, I look at garbage and waste uh, to tell or to inform about people as well and what could have been done differently in the, in the creation of that material or that product. So I trace my work all the way back to the person who literally designed that item. So if I show up on your doorstep, it's not a good thing um, because I'm looking at, you know, what were you thinking in a sense when you made this uh, decision to make this particular product who ultimately ended up in the waste stream. Um, and so that's where a majority of my research uh, grants come from is the re-engineering of sorts of, of materials and products. Uh, and it's all based on, you know, what we call a throwaway society. We throw away literally everything. We make things to throw it away. And I'm basically trying to fight that, that battle by looking at the circular economy and how we can get things back in and then create that as part of who we are uh, rather than the, uh, the disposable economy. Very cool. Before we move on, I just wanted to give um, Hannah and Kuba a chance to, to join in this, this question about careers. Any, I don't mean to pressure you, but any any questions? If not, we can move on. So I have more questions to come. No, I mean I don't I don't have any questions. I I I don't really consider myself as somebody who's like further along in my career. But I I worked for a really long time, almost a decade, at the New Yorker magazine, and I I think that's sort of where I learned the ways that incisive writing can contribute to and and influence a sort of historically relevant dialogue. Um, and so I sort of think of that as as an early iteration of my career um, and the ways that it's influenced the work that I do now, um, which is to take that journalism type um, inquiry and turn it into sort of imagination type inquiry. Um, and so it's shifted, but um, I still have that foundation of how to translate complex ideas into compelling stories. Cool. I also don't have any question, but 
I would say my struggle was always, you know, uh, about the miscommunication between design principles, design pr practices, and the actual users of those spaces. Because, you know, throughout my educational life, I was always exposed to this pressure of, you know, you have to design something beautiful, you have to design something very, you know, powerful, it must have some sort of a, you know, power, powerful statement or language, but we always miss this idea of, you know, having certain uh, level of connection with the actual users, the community. So that actually led me to de-learn what I learned so far and, you know, reverse the approaches that I had till now so that, you know, I can ground myself as a social scientist who basically engages with the community and understand their needs and, you know, behave accordingly. Thank you. That's great. Um, uh, we're around the time when the Q&A should start. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask people to start sending in their questions. And as we wait for those questions to be collected and then sort of sent to me so we can begin that process, I'm going to, I want to get in my last question because I know people are probably shaking their heads about this last question. But, um, and I, I have to admit that I, I stole the question from um, Radio Lab. I don't know if any of you listen to Radio Lab, but uh, it's a question about, um, Richard Feynman, the, um, the famous physicist. And back in 1961, he famously taught this intro to physics class. And he asked his students a very simple question, not simple, but a very direct question. He said, if, throughout, if through some cataclysm, all scientific knowledge were to be lost and only one sentence could be passed on to the following generation, what single statement would contain the most information in the fewest words? And I want to pose that same question about climate change, which may be, you know, our own cataclysm. What single sentence would you pass on about climate change um, to the, the future generation? And it doesn't have to necessarily be a scientific, you know, data-driven sentence, but um, I'm just wondering. You've all had a little bit of time to think about this, but it's a tough question. You could we could talk for hours about it. The silence is deafening. <laughs> um, I can jump in. Uh, it's not exactly a sentence, but you know, that's, that's words. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. We'll take what I would get. Learn by doing and uh, organize. Yeah, I had a, a similar kind of thought, which was, you know, use your brains, you know, sprinkle in some science and protect each other. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, it's the simple things, you know, you know, science is actually cool. It actually makes you figure things out. And I'm not sure exactly how we got off the rail on that one, but yeah, that's very simple. Great. Anyone else? Well, I was sort of thinking about, um, quoting from David Suzuki uh, from his book, The Sacred Balance, Rediscovering Our Place in Nature. And he says, life thrives on life, um, which I think is great, but the copy editor muscle is really strong in me still. And I immediately think about how it can be said in even fewer words. <laughs> so I came to the idea that life nourishes life, which actually feels even more applicable to me because thrives implies a certain like flourishing. And I think we're very far away from the idea of flourishing. Whereas nourish implies a certain kind of like caring and sustenance and science. So um, yeah, life nourishes life. Fantastic. I had more of like a general, general statement because um, I've sort of been thinking about like the future. I've, I've been reading a lot of reports recently as to how our future will look. And uh, this is something that has been on my mind for a little bit. And it's the fact that don't let the mistakes of the past drive your future. Um, I mean, uh, what climate change looks to us right now is going to be very different in 20 years um, because everything is so dynamic. And what we, what we in our generation did a few years ago does not hold true anymore. Uh, uh, in as little as a decade. 
So um, in, in the grander scheme of things, um, I think it's just important to keep our keep the focus on the future. I, mine was a, was a nasty one. I mean, the only thing I could think of. So I'll tell you if you want to hear. We want to hear. We want to hear. Okay. Mine is if the human race doesn't get serious about addressing this assault on Earth's environment within the next generation, we'll probably wind up extinct and it won't be pretty. How's that? Great. That's about how close we are. I was ready for some anger, and I think that got it there, some, some sort of activist anger. Good. It's sort of interesting that, you know, um, Tugba, did you want to go? I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, sure. Um, I wanted to say that climate change is a process, meaning that, you know, rather than looking down on your own and try to solve the problem by yourself, I think we all need to look up together and build, you know, a way out towards the change. Because, you know, I think I always had this struggle with, you know, top-down solutions. And I think the only way we have right now is building a way out together. I think, yeah, that's the right. It's just so interesting because, you know, Feynman's um, answer was, was very scientific. It was about molecules and how molecules work and how they push together and pull apart. And he said that those, that brief sentence on how molecules work explains like everything from the emergence of life to industrialization, you know, to climate change, right? But all of our answers were much more sort of, um, you know, I guess humanistic is, is, is the term, but less scientific. Um, in some ways, it really speaks to the need to communicate in both ways, right? To understand the science, but also when it comes down to it, this is not only a scientific issue and problem, but something that's very, very, you know, uh, cultural in a way, I guess. Um, um, so if some people can get some questions to us, that would be great. Um, one of the participants said, if you could wave a magic wand and change one thing about human behavior, what would that one thing be? This is another question from a participant. Yeah, something I already said, you know, the magic wand would just be, first of all, people have to care about each other. I mean, that's just a simple thing that your parents used to tell you, but geez. I'm not sure how far we've gotten away from just the simple task of just, if you actually cared about people, then a lot of what we're talking about would not be so hard um, to, uh, to, to pull in. For, you know, this whole division has really hurt us a lot. And so that would be the magic wand for me, just, you know, just getting people. To, and then after that, then you work together and things seem to be, uh, good when you actually have a good relationship you, you always do you know great things but you know it's making people care for each other i would add to that oh sorry just dr lines i would add to what what you're saying that um and include the non-human world also in in what people need to start to care about and, and value equally yeah i mind is that uh every single thing you do has consequences. So you think about every single thing you do. You buy a car, you take a drive, you, whatever you do, think about it. Um, I guess I would join um, the statement that Hannah was making, uh, Robin Wall Kimmer, who's this fantastic ethnobotanist, but also a indigenous person of the Potawatomi, um, a Potawatomi citizen. Uh, she talks about the basic relationships between humans and more than humans, so what we call more than humans, and really sa and says that we have to change our language. Um, so she refers to uh, a single entity, whether it's a rock or a person or a, an animal, or creature as key and the plural as kin. 
And I love the kin part because it really is, talks about a kinship and doesn't kind of create this hierarchy uh, and superiority. Um, so there are lots of fundamental issues of Western philosophy and its contrast to other traditional cultures that is, is just kind of embodied in those basic questions. Yeah. So one of the participants asked, um, how do we transform corporate attitudes to prioritize climate change? And I would broaden that out and just say, what do we all feel about how do we challenge power? And, and, and power and structural material power and structural material entities to try to do this work that we're, we're doing here. Because it really comes down to, to that, right? So corporations, um, you know, again, going back to kind of what I just said, once they separate themselves from the community, that's when they, they run into trouble. You know, they're made up of people who come from the community and of the people. And for some reason, there's this separation of, you know, who we are, we, you know, we are either making something or providing some uh, major service of some sort. And they have the people who work there captured because we're paying you, we're paying you to do something. And somehow or another, the, the distance between that and the community and how these uh, corporations and who works in them, the diverse nature of who works there, not being a reflection of the, the communities that they serve is historically been a big problem. And so I think that's where, you know, we can begin to start to have that conversation, but, you know, the farther away that they are from a reflection of what the people that they, in a sense, are selling stuff to, um, the gulf between that and, and who they serve the bigger that gets, the more they become irresponsible. Um, and so that's kind of what I've been looking at as well. You know, the makeup of these corporations is really, you know, fascinating when you find their, their value systems that are much different than what, you know, the community or the people that they actually serve. Could I try to bring that same idea across a whole different, to a whole different field? And this is for you, Hannah. Um, I remember when, when, um, you were in one of my classes that we talked about literature as power and writing as power and sort of a very different sort of power than corporate power, right? But um, can you talk about that type of power and how it functions for you or maybe how you see that as something we need to address or, or sort of deal with in some way? Yes, I mean, I, I, I think it's crucial. Um, in recruiting more people to this cause and to um, setting the balance right, um, to sort of have, make it easier to imagine um, other possibilities and other ways of existing in this world. And for me, I mean, a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, undoing the exploitation and the horrors of that capitalism has created in this country and undoing ideas of nationalism and, and um, all these uh, really abstract ideologies. And because they're so abstract and so hard to communicate sometimes, I think for me at least, um, literature really helps to go past the abstract and go past um, the details and convert more people to the ideology or in ways that is, are is less alienating um, than the science or, or the all-encompassing or overwhelming ideas can sometimes be. Other forms of power that people want to address or talk about or highlight for us so we keep them in mind as well? I would I mean, say... I, oh, go ahead, Togwa. Right. Okay. So I would say we should gather as much voices as we can, because let's say this is a process that requires hundreds of years to change or like to solve the problem. Like it is like unimaginable for many of us because we don't have that much time. But if we gather, let's say hundred people's voices at the same time, you know, we can make a hundred years of birth of progress in a very short short period of time. And I think it will empower many people around the world so that you know we can fight against big corporates or like 
or like any other oppositions against against the change. Uh, I would like to make a modest proposal, which is that those of us within our university and the community that we work with, the communities that we're from and we work with, we should just uh, form a, a university or a college within the university and just focus on these issues. Um, it seems to me that unless universities and the institutions that we're all parts of start dramatically uh, focusing and shifting, we're not going to be able to get anywhere. And I, I know there are so many really great people on our campus, but in some ways the structures of our regular semester by semester organization just kind of keep us from being able to focus on problem solving together. I, I would love for us to be able to do that together, so. Jack, do you want to mention um, the Hacking the University conference that you had that initiated that just briefly so people understand that there has been a process that's already begun and that there's a community of people both from the university, but also beyond the university who are interested in that sort of project or? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's so many people on our campus, but people have been kind of fragmented and, and um, not having a chance in their daily work or their semester work to work together. Uh, the Humanities Action Lab, for example, has been doing a lot of work and trying to uh, encourage uh, classes to be taught. And we've been working at the Price Institute uh, in trying to collaborate on that. Um, it's been great working with the Honors College and HLOC, um, for example, because we can do work together. Um, I feel it's just a beginning though. Um, I've been trying to offer a basic intro class um, to encourage more and more students to just feel they don't have to be a specialist to take it. Um, and uh, so there are bits and pieces that are going that are happening. And uh, of course, um, Alec and, and Kevin have been there. I mean, they've been on campus for much longer and been really you know, pushing this for much longer. Um, it just seems that we're actually in a, on a great campus that can actually do things together. Uh, we're a relatively smaller campus and um, they've got amazing undergrads. Um, the undergrads that I've been working with are outstanding and they, they bring so much knowledge and so much ability to communicate to their families and their communities in the great diversity of places that they come from. It seems that there's a lot of hope and potential there. If we could just kind of reorganize ourselves and do these things together and just um, starting to offer intensive concentrated problem solving efforts. Um, it seems that we can actually do quite a bit. I would also add that conferences like this or panels like this, is the, the, I mean, that's the big, this is an important beginning. It's a way of like challenging the divide between established academics and emerging academics and the divide between disciplines. And um, so much of this is about rejecting binaries and we're only gonna achieve anything if we reject the inevitable hierarchies that come with those binaries. Um, and I think that we can, we're doing exactly that. We're starting here and it, you know, it, you can extrapolate or scale out from there and, and have it be about identity or between political and cultural and social fields or science fields. And um, we're putting that into practice right now when we talk about these things. Um, there's a question here. For, first of all, I wanna mention that um, Kevin just wanted to put into the chat that uh, be, we'll be issuing our very first university-wide climate action plan this summer, and that um, he's co-chair of the Climate tax Task Force, so please look out for that. Um, a question here, um, let me see. Uh, yeah, okay. So what advice would you give someone who wants to talk, who, who wants to talk about climate change with people who may not believe in it? This is a question from one of our our audience members. How do you communicate to non-believers? Yeah, I get this one all the time as well. You know, the first thing I do is I get into their belief system. What do they actually believe in? I'll find, sometimes I'll find a, a, a crack in there somewhere, um, but I am not there to obviously, you know, beat somebody over the head if their belief system is not you know, any was close to what we're talking about. But I really always want to find out, so where are you coming from and where, where, where are you drawing your facts from? And, you know, I, I try my best to, to get them to, you know, tell me a story. 
about what it is that you're um, thinking or what you're thinking about and let them, you know, talk until they can't have anything else to talk about. <laughs> and then I'll uh, get into hopefully a nice dialogue with them. But, you know, that's a tough one. You know, someone is really just dead set on not believing. It's got to be based on something. And I really am very interested to find out what that is. I mean, I could say a little bit. I mean, I obviously at my age, considering what, what people change to, I know a lot of people my age who are conservative and they kind of reject the whole thing. But uh, so I don't use climate change as just one. Climate change to me is just one piece of a whole bunch of problems that are all coming together at the same time. And there's, at some point, some of those things they can see. So for example, I have friends who plant gardens. And when I was a kid, there were bees everywhere and butterflies, and now there's none. And they see that. And I see, you see, this is the problem. You, if, you, these are the, if they can see things, then they start to believe that there are changes that are taking place that need to be addressed. It sounds like what you're both saying is you gotta take the time to listen and get inside their thinking. To, if you want to have a dialogue, right? And I think that's, it's just so important. Um, so this is from, uh, anyone else want to come in on that? Because I have another question here coming in here um, from Gabriella Calvin. Often when discussing climate change, the topic is discussed as a matter so large that, is, that it's for politicians and their governments to solve. However, what is, meaning, what is a meaningful course of action an individual can take to do what they can to help? It's a really important, great question. One that we all feel and all face, right? Any answers? Well, as I said before, everything everybody does should be thought about and done deliberately. So, you know, whether it's, you know, the other day I saw a talk on, on uh, that there's only 20,000 uh, monarch butterflies left, and there were 25 million in the in the 80s. And the problem is, is everybody has to have green lawns. So you think, oh, what does it make you having a green lawn really do? Or oh, you know, I need the space, so I'll just buy a big SUV. Everything you do has consequences. Just think it through before you uh, before you do anything. Reverend Kimmer has a really good um, answer to this question too. It, it's um relates to what Dr. Gates is saying also, and what she recommends is for people who have doubt or people who don't have doubt but don't know what to do is to plant a garden. And it can be as tiny as it, like if all you have is a shoebox, do plant it in a shoebox in a window, but that um, learning how to nurture and learning that the, the care that it requires to support an ecosystem and then nourish yourself from that ecosystem and vice versa, um, teaches you everything that you need to know, even if it's in a, the tiniest way possible. So you could start there. Yeah, except okay. without pesticides, herbicides, or chemical fertilizers, right? Well, I'm gonna play devil's advocate for a minute. <laughs> and I think that that's great, Hannah. And I, I have a garden and I teach my sons how to be nurturers in the garden. Um, but I think we also have to, you know, get out of the garden and take to the streets a little bit too, right? So I know you're not saying it's either or, right? But um, how do we convince people to do, to take that step too, you know? It's, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's gotta be inclusive as well because I think for all of my arc of my career, it's always been when I go to conferences and such, the same people that are always there. You know, we have not talked about this in our urban communities you know, and the issue has always been, well, they got so many other things to be concerned about. So, you know, just adding this additional thing about climate change is way too much more for them to handle, which is not true. Um, I think that folks in their inner cities have issues with, you know, asthma and other things that affect their personal health. And the quality of life is connected to climate change. And whether or not you know, you can make that connection or not. It's, sometimes it's hard, but I think that when folks see that, how other things that have, uh, that are affecting them in a sense, like, you know, the increase the amount of particulates that are in the air that are causing your asthmatic, you know, uh, you know, attack and other things that, you know, affect people personally is when 
you start to see people take action. But connecting the dots between that, and this is the reason why this is happening, is where I think we need to spend a little bit more of our time. There's another question here. Um, I'm going to expand it a little bit, but the question is, in what ways can coding contribute to making any dent on the issue of climate change? And I would just expand that to, to talk about data, um, data in general, and sort of, and I mean that very, very broadly. Um, I'm a historian, but I have my students, I think of their historical research, primary research as, as data collection. So how can coding or data contribute to making a dent in this issue of climate change? I can, I can sort of take a first shot at it. Um, I actually believe that there is an excessive amount of data right now that people can use and, and are being used to generate these, uh, you know, super complicated climate models uh, to predict how things are going to look in the future. But um, it's very easy to go down that data rabbit hole. Um, data generates more data. These models, again, generate more data with sort of, and you can play around with these models forever and sort of be caught in that loop. Um, I think at this point, we have enough data to sort of project our near as well as long-term future. Um, and it's important now to use that data, uh, mobilize around, you know, mobilize people around these issues and push for uh, better policies, um, either top down from the government or what I like to call bottom-up approach from like the community grassroots level. Um, I, I've recently been using the term death by data and I think we're, we're gonna approach that very soon uh, if we don't sort of, you know, take a step back and reassess that, you know, what is all this data doing? And I'm sorry, I, I sound a little bit negative on it. It's just that, you know, I've sat through so many conversations and so many presentations on, um, you know, computer scientists, uh, geoscientists working on these models, but where is all this going? Well, your, your comment brought up another sort of question for me. You mentioned top-down data, but you also mentioned bottom-up data, and I'm wondering about the role of citizen science and, and citizen knowledge and all of this, and I thought maybe people could talk about, you know, both the top-down and the bottom-up and how they can, how often they're at odds, but often they can work together, they can also work together. Anyone want to grab it? I would say, I think right now our job is about, you know, making sense of data and making it understandable for everyone so that, you know, everyone can find a way to deal with the issue. This is what I we have been doing with Oman Jana and Scott Bernstein, maybe since the beginning of last summer. I mean, we, we have all these great data, like, and, you know, we realize that we don't need any more data. It's just all we need to do is, you know, making sense of it and making it understandable for everyone else. So, I still think you can have a lot of bottom up, you know, work that can do. I mean, people say, oh, these companies do things, but reality is if you stop buying all the products from those companies, they'll go out of business. So, you know, consumers have a lot of power. I mean, you could even see recently, we, you know, the, they would have kept that Indian Point nuclear power plant open forever if there wasn't pressure to shut it. And so, you know, basic, I think the biggest problem is, is there's so much misinformation out there that people don't understand, you know, a lot of what need, should and needs to be done. And so they can get confused. If we could manage to get it a little clearer so that people understood, you know, what they could do and what power they control, 